Uh -huh. Hi, this is Al Snow, former WWE superstar, and you're listening to Mitch Please. So I'm sitting here very relaxed in my room while the rain drops down and I'm just reflecting on how amazing this weekend, this last weekend was. You know, I could go on for a long time talking about it. I'm not going to go on for a very long time because we have an amazing interview on Mitch Please this week. Mitch Please, episode 16. Thanks for giving it a click, by the way. This week, this episode, because I know I told you guys we're going to be doing this once a month. And we did. We did one in September. We've already done one in October. But I'm giving you another October episode, episode 16. Here we are. And this episode is going to include an amazing interview with Bradley Rotten, a.k.a. Nothing Left, a.k.a. Bradley Justin Finney. I'm really excited for you guys to hear this interview. You know, a lot of people know Bradley Rotten. A lot of people don't know Bradley Rotten, actually. And this episode, you're going to learn a lot about that man. But before we do that, like I was saying, reflecting on this weekend, I mean, you know, what, what, what can you say? It's, uh, you know, I went 11 months without stepping out in front of a crowd, a, a pro wrestling crowd and performing and and. 11 months to the day and really on november 21st 2015 at work farm wars you know you can find the episode on the pcw youtube channel i'm the first uh you know pcw performer besides james Haight and at the time president dick sexton that walked out there and i walked out there uh also with the donovan troy and agb and i walked out there with a sling in a sling with my pcw heavyweight sh wrestling championship and i handed it over and then i got and then i shook let's see let's let's see how it went i think i grabbed the microphone with my left arm put it in my slinged up right arm and shook the hand of Dick Sexton, Taylor Gregory, and I shook the hand of James Haight. And then I took that microphone and I spoke from the heart. And I said, hey, you know, in fact, this is what I said. It's like this, guys. Jesse Cole Mitchell. Birthday 12-17-87. Since I was 18 years old, this was what I wanted. This right here. Standing on my leg. Pro Championship Wrestling. PCW. This is my dream, is Pro Championship Wrestling. And you know what? I've made a lot of mistakes. I've screwed up a lot over the last decade. And that's my fault. But I just want to say thank you to Zach Reed, Mr. Primetime. Yeah. I want to say thank you to Rick Luxury. Yeah. Because they watched me screw up. And they could have kicked my ass and kicked me out of here a long time ago. But they believed in Jesse Cole Mitchell. And I, and, and I believe in Jesse Cole Mitchell. And I believe, guys, 
that it, it is my time to go away for a little bit. I appreciate that. But it's time for me to go. Guys, if you really love something, sometimes you have to leave it. But I'm going to promise you guys one thing. I will, one day, be back. And I will prove exactly how great I am. And to all the fans that come out here and support Pro Championship Wrestling and have for almost 17 years, I want to apologize to each and every one of you. And I just want to say thank you. And 11 months to the day. I am back. November 21st, 2015. Enter October 21st, 2016. And it's Uncle Love, Mitchie Valentine, making his managerial debut with his client, his nephew, Cupid Mikey Shoop for fist combat for Mikey Gordon who is a guy that I met through the Chico comedy scene at the Chico comedy festival a year and a half ago and he's a guy that a lot of people have a lot to say about but he's a guy to me that has always been as cool as a fan and I'm talking about one of those, a, a fan that you plug in the wall, not a fan that you sign their autograph. M Mikey Gordon is as cool as the air conditioning system that works. You know, a working air conditioning system. He's cool. That's what I'm going to say. He's a cool guy. He's a cool guy. I've always thought he was a cool guy, and I always wanted to work with him. And I was able to send, you know, Patrick Abbott and Will Roberts down there to work for him while I was in Pennsylvania. And man, that felt good. You know, it feels good doing that. But it felt amazing to walk out there in Santa Cruz at that VFW hall outside last outdoor event of the year <clears throat> um you know interesting setup but very passionate crowd those people loved pro wrestling they they enjoyed the show they were entertained and they were loud there was only about 40 or 50 of them but you know what i love smaller crowds because i've performed in front of 500 plus but I like performing sometimes better in front of 50, 50 or less because it's, it's harder to get a loud reaction and, you know, it's more intimate and more special sometimes. Sometimes not. Sometimes being in front of a big crowd, you know, it has its pluses too and I'm sure we'll get to that. But, um... Like I said, I do have to, I do have to wrap this up here soon. I want to get over to Bradley Rotten's interview. Uh, we spent a lot of time here, um, but I just want to go through you know this weekend as, as quick as I can. And I know I have a lot to say, and I can never shut up. And sometimes I say too much, and that's gotten me in a lot of trouble over the years. And a lot of people in the wrestling business don't like me. A lot of people in NorCal Wrestling have this image of me. Uh, I don't know what the image is, because I'm not them. But I know who I am, and I know that I needed to take that break. And I needed to come back at Fist Combat. And that's what I did with QP Mikey Shoop. And we got in there. We made an open challenge. And, you know, we had the baby oil. And the, and the promos online with the baby oil. The baby oil was just an idea that I just, I called Shoop up. And I said, what are we going to do? And he said, I don't know. And I said, what about baby oil? And he laughed. And, uh, and we went to film the promo. And Kimmy didn't even want to film it. She said, this is disgusting. And I said, exactly. 
because that's what you do when you're a heel. And that's what we did. And those people hated us. And they loved our opponent, who was Diego Rubio, who happened to be the PCW Living the Dream 3, Living the Dream 2012 winner. And I haven't seen him since. I haven't seen him since. Uh, it, was, it was a good three, four years since I'd seen the guy. And, uh, you know, Diego, um, you know, I, I hope that he continues to, to do professional wrestling and train and get better because the kid has a lot of heart. And he's a great kid. And I was really happy to be working with him. And we did the match. And it was fun. And those people hated us. And Mikey told me that's how it's, you know, he, he, Mikey gave me my props as soon as I got back there. He gave Shoop his props. And that means a lot. You know, I, I really realized recently how much verbal, um, ver- people verbalizing how they feel. And especially like, you know, good, good or bad is very important to me. So Mikey doing that, um, you know, and he meant it. It's not just the bullshit, you know, oh yeah, great match kid. You know, great, great job. Great job. Everything's great. He's just like, damn, that's what I want on my show. And that's what you brought. And that's what I'm going to continue to bring. That's what Cupid Mikey Shoop is going to continue to bring. We're coming. We came to fist combat and now we're coming to fist combat to be in the main event. And I'll get to my, uh, I'll get to all that later. I want to also talk about driving out to Gold Rush Pro Wrestling in um, American Canyon, which is a place I'd never been, which was crazy and a whole whole nother story. But you know, it was uh, it was Zach, Mister Prime Time, MPT Reeb defending his Gold Rush Championship against Rick Luxury. And it was the first singles match those two had had since August 20th, 2011. And I wasn't going to miss it for the world. So I drove out there. And um, it was the greatest Gold Rush Pro Wrestling show I've ever seen. I've been to quite a few, and I've watched quite a few. And it's the best one I've ever seen. Props to Sparky Ballard. Very well booked very well put together the talent went out there and killed it and uh shout out to shout out to Fatu man Jacob Fatu is a guy that you're going to be hearing that name a lot and I wouldn't be surprised if sooner rather than later he's in NXT um you know Desi Dorada and Shotzi Blackheart went out there and had an amazing women's match you know Will Roberts and Marcus Lewis athletically went out there and killed it um, and, and so much more, and so much more. Oh, the 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 four way. You got to talk about the 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 beefy four way. Kratos and Crody and uh, Jody and Sin. You know, went out there and brawled all over the building and, and just had an amazing match. But MPT versus Rick Luxury for the first time in over five years, one on one, stole the show, and it was delightful to watch delightful (laughs) so um you know it but was even what was even better than that was the day before you know hanging out with a guy like kalo while he drove us down there and back and seeing a, a kid like that with so much heart that would just do anything for his friends you know that was amazing that was delightful that was fantastic and what was also fantastic was after the gold rush pro wrestling show on saturday watching everybody as a team whether they were in the main event or whether they just started training and paying their dues was to watch those 30 dudes probably and a couple chicks at the end of the night piece by piece take down that immaculate gold rush pro wrestling set ring lights staging everything uh, 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 stage you know entryway set guardrails i mean sparky ballard has the most immaculate like uh you know difficult really uh wrestling setup i've ever seen outside of championship wrestling from hollywood that i've ever personally seen Uh, um so Props to those guys. And, and, you know, it felt so amazing. So good. 
to have all these guys, you know, at Fist Combat in Santa Cruz and, and at Gold Rush Pro Wrestling in American Canyon just come up and be so happy to see me, you know, because a lot of people haven't seen me in a year and they were, they were happy to see me and, and people want to, people want me a part of their show and that feels really good because I want to be a part of of the show. You guys have heard me on here depressed going through it. You know, wrestling performing is in my blood. I have to do it. And now I'm back. And I'm going to be doing it. And I'm going to be telling you about where and when I'm going to be doing it. And I'm going to update you guys also on my surgery which is going down here in less than 48 hours as I record this. After we get to this interview with Bradley Rotten, please enjoy it. This guy has a story to tell. We are rolling sound outside of the Rotten Retreat, the Brad Pad. We're sitting here in a car. We're going to get extremely sweaty in just mere minutes because my guest this week has a dog, and it's a beautiful dog. But it's a very overly excited, loud, screeching, barking, yelping, door-scratching dog named Lily. And uh, I want to go ahead and welcome to the show right now, Bradley Rotten. Brad, welcome to Mitch, please. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, And thanks to William Butler for uh, my lunatic dog. Propane, man. What my name is. We got to put the blame on him. That's that's what we're gonna do. And uh, you know, we yeah, we 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 started doing this podcast outside. It, it just wasn't gonna work with the dog. So now we're in the car. Uh, we're we're. I'm already sweating. I'm always sweating, bro. I sweat more than anybody I know, except for maybe Hot Ronnie. Uh, but but Bradley Rotten, man. Uh, Bradley Justin Finney. Uh, I want to know about. Your life, man. I want to know about life growing up. Where did you grow up? Um, I grew up in Southern California, um, a place called Torrance, which is uh, South Bay. So it's like L.A. County, but by the beach, Hermosa Beach, and stuff like that. Cool, man. So you grew up by Muscle Beach. That's, that explains the uh, fabulous, hot, muscled-up body that you have. Hermosa. Hermosa <laughs> Beach, where... Um, uh, I think the biggest claim to fame there would be Pennywise, I would think, off the top of my head. Uh, that, you know, comes from Hermosa. Say uh, that again, Penny what? Pennywise, the band, the punk band, Pennywise. Oh, okay, you know, yeah. like, Pennywise the Clown. Well, I know now, man, because the only punk rock music I listen to is your music, and then that one uh, show at the Maltese that we went to, and we listened to, uh, <laughs> what was it, Gorilla Gorilla or something? Yeah. Well, yeah, man, that was a good show. I had a good time that night. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. I forget I don't remember. I've gone to so many punk rock shows that it's kind of hard to remember who's who. And unless, like, I specifically remember the flyer in my head, and, you know, or I remember certain things about it. But yeah, some friends of mine were playing, and it, Gorilla Gorilla was one of the bands playing. Yeah, it was at the Maltese, man. It was a good time. Like I said, um, I'm not super familiar with punk rock music, but for you, man, I mean, growing up in Southern California, um, you know, you. You're you're a you know accomplished musician, accomplished pro wrestling manager. Uh, when did you discover music and pro wrestling, and how did it uh, affect you? Um, I well, it was pretty early on. Like um, my dad, growing up, when I lived in Torrance, um, the first house that I remember living in that stands out in my mind. That like, I like I remember what my room looked like. Like I remember when I was a kid for some odd reason I wanted um. I wanted, like, um, bar swinging doors, like cowboy doors. I don't know why I had this obsession, but it was the door that led from, like, uh, the, the house. It was like a circle. You could cut through my room to get into the hallway and then get into the living room and then get into the kitchen. You could circle around. I used to run around the house. And uh, that house is the first place I remember kind of, like, falling in love with music. My dad used to be really anal about his records. Like, when I was a real little kid, he used to tell me to stay away from him. He had made a, a like, a entertainment center be- before they were, like, um, it was, like, a thing to be able to, like, make them and sell them. And uh, he made one, and I remember the whole bottom row was nothing but records, and I was always in- interested in them. 
And then when I got old enough, when I got to be about well, seven or eight, I started like fingering through his Black Sabbath records and like his um, his Led Zeppelin records and stuff. And then at that same time, I would get up really fucking early for Spider Man at like six in the morning. Like we'd lay the blanket out, me and my sister, my older sister, and we'd fight over what cartoons to watch. <laughs> Oh, Spider-Man animated series, man. Yes, One of the greatest yes. series of all time. Well, the early, yeah, the late 80s. Yeah, it was 80s or mid-80s. Um, and uh, I remember around 10 o'clock or so is when the wrestling would come on. And I was, like every other story, I was instantly glued. No, like, now, sorry to cut you off, Rod. Before we get into the wrestling, I want to know about that and, and what and who in wrestling inspired you. But what kind of music were you listening to? You know, were you really uh, attracted to? Uh, you know, growing up and, and that you first remember. Um. Well, as far as I guess looking at it in a being a musician perspective, I would say, um, in retrospect, like the Beatles and the Jackson Five, and like I think on each side of my like my mom and my dad's side uh, from either one of them I have huge music influences like my dad really turned me on to like um, like he understood my, like my rebellious um, side of me especially when I was a teenager I can think early on he got why I wanted to go to the record store and check out and go dig through boxes to find cool records because I just was fascinated by rock music. I just got turned on to it. Really. And it was like at an age where you either obsess on it and then you get over it and you just and you decide you just you don't like it and you just you don't care anymore or you continue to obsess on it and like I continue to obsess on it. Like I was always reading uh you know metal magazines and and like always buying cassette tapes with my lawn mowing money and stuff like that so i was listening to a lot of like classic rock what's considered or i guess was considered classic rock then and then my older cousins turned me on to like faith no more and the red hot chili peppers and uh like early metallica like thrash and punk and then once i heard the dead kennedys and like uh, suicidal tendencies and stuff like that. The Dead Milkmen. It was like I, at that point, I had found my own music. It was all about punk rock because it was offensive. Mom didn't like it, so it pissed mom off. <laughs> yeah, but I was all about it. <laughs> oh, I hear you, man. It sounds like your musical. You you explored all different sorts of music, man, and you really was something that really affected you. Um, and I want to talk more about that because you had a, a, you know, you still have a musical career that you're pursuing. Um, but what about wrestling, man? 10 a.m. Saturday mornings, what were you watching? What hooked you in? Oh, man. Well, that, like I was saying, like kind of at the same time, it's like fingering through my father's records and stuff. I was getting into wrestling and I remember having, um, I, early on it was very, every once in a while mom would let me watch it. Um, she didn't let me watch it all the time, though, and I don't, I, my only guess, um, is that it was just, I was a little kid, and it was a depiction of fighting, so, she probably didn't want me to be watching something that would encourage me to go <laughs> fighting with my sister or something. Yeah, my mom hated wrestling, too, bro. <laughs> I right, right. feel you. Right. But, she, once I got into it heavily enough she knew there was no arguing she once i got to that point to where it was like okay well he's decided he's not gonna let us argue argue it and then but then it became the number one grounding point like every time i got in trouble it was like i wasn't allowed they to took watch your wrestling, wrestling away man yeah, i know yeah. that's what happened to me they take yeah. smackdown away or, or raw or they take a pay-per-view man it was ridiculous right. outrageous so who were some of the guys in wrestling that hooked you right away man like uh you know hulk hogan B uh, bobby the brain heenan well that's such a loaded question because you say Bobby the Brain Heenan and you obviously, you know me well enough to know I'm going to say Bobby Heenan. But it, early on, like, I didn't watch it that much. And then when I moved to my grandfather's house, he was building, a, the, my grandfather built a whole back room. Like he added on to this house that he bought. 
And while he was doing that, he would tell me stories. And keep in mind at this point, like, I'm hearing these stories from very little watching wrestling. Like, I knew who Big John Studd was, I knew who Hulk Hogan was, I knew who the Iron Sheik was. And the whole, like, Cindy Lauper, you know, Andre the Giant, Hogan thing was going on. But my grandfather was telling me about Gorgeous George and, like, how he and his buddies, they would save their money from chores. They would save their quarter or whatever. Mm -hmm. And they would go on Saturdays and he and his buddies would go to the, uh, to the um, Olympic Auditorium and go see professional wrestling and turns out I didn't realize it until I put the stories together um, that my grandfather had went to see Gordish George uh, in uh, you know where he where his hair was a stipulation where his hair was on the line for the first time and uh, thinking back I'm kind of amazed it's almost like oh wow it was sounds cheesy but oh I guess I was sort of like, it gives me the feeling that I was supposed to have some sort of involvement. Yeah, no in doubt, wrestling. man. No doubt. And it's ironic, too, man, because my grandma and her brother, they used to go see jo Gorgeous George all the time, too. I'm not sure what venue it was, but Gorgeous George used to throw his bobbing pins to my grandma, bro. My grandma caught yeah. a couple of them, and they had pictures and autographs and all that stuff. No, that's cool, man. So your grandpa was into it. Your mom, not so much. What about your dad? Did he like wrestling? Um, Yeah, but I think it was more of like, that became more of a bond with he and I that like it was just some it was something for us to do together um, but I had not before I got into like watching it heavily I didn't really watch it I had more known about it from stories from my grandfather and then we would watch it on ESPN he would come call me into the living room and we would watch like they would do repeats of like old gorgeous George matches or Wahoo McDaniel or whatever and then I would watch, uh, and then and when I got old enough to, uh, well, and then I got diagnosed with diabetes, and that's when it all really changed, because I became a person that was, like, stuck, um, I didn't go out, like, I was, I had caught a pneumonia, which, um, on top of getting diabetes, like, and diabetes had run in my family, so I had to spend a long time in the hospital. How old were you? I was eight. I was, I got, yeah, I remember going when I was like eight, and I remember feeling weird after eating and being like, I had to go to the bathroom all the time, I had to pee all the time, and these were just like symptoms of being diabetic. And um, I went to the, the hospital, I went to the children's hospital, you know, and uh, to see my doctor, and they went, oh, you're not, they tested my blood sugar, and they go, oh, you're not diabetic. They're like, well, just to make sure, go go to the snack bar, go get a candy bar or something, and then come back. And I, I ate a candy bar, and they tested my blood, they're like, oh, well, no, you're, yeah, no, we think you're, yeah, you're diabetic. <laughs> and I was like, oh, and they, and they, all I remember thinking is like, oh, I can't eat candy? No, like Halloween's gonna suck. Like I just remember being a kid. That was my only. I didn't think of anything else that went along with having a disease or having this illness or, or having to have to deal with something. My only thought was like, oh fuck, I can't eat candy. What you're telling me? I can't eat candy bars. Like what? What do you mean? But that's when I started watching wrestling regularly because I was stuck in the hospital all the time. Like I wasn't. There was nothing else for me to do but watch cartoons and draw and read. So I started watching wrestling and then my grandfather started coming in when he would visit and we would watch Superstars and we would watch Spotlight and Saturday, uh, Saturday Night's main event was like where it was like that and Clash of the Champions were like I had to see them. Like if there was a situation where you were to tell me that I couldn't, I would argue. And I would ask you literally logically well why well wait what do you mean we're going there yep but clash of the champions is on why are we going grocery shopping when clash of the champions is on can't we do that afterwards you know we're like it did in my world it was unlogical to not watch wrestling so that's kind of like what being in the hospital was kind of like how i got i like where i was following it and, and speak and speaking of being in the hospital 
<clears throat> Speaking of being in the hospital, Rotten, so you diabetic since you were eight. What about the blindness in your eye? A lot of people don't know. Some Most people that know you do know, but you're, you're blind in one eye. Right. How did that come about? That, uh, by <laughs> sheer luck, I guess, I was born that way, so... I uh, had eight. Now, I don't know the exact story of how I got a cataract in my eye. Except for my sister says that somehow my mom caught rubella. Rubella turned into a cataract in my eye or something along those lines. I don't know how. I don't know what rubella is. I don't know how it. I don't know what that is. So I don't know if that story is all true. Sounds like rebellion, like a rotten rebellion. Right. Right, uh, but basically one thing led to another, which led to the cataract in my eye, which I was born with, and then my um, left eye is just not so good from my diabetes over the years. I just had have had a long, I've had it for a long time, and there have been times where it's like harder to take care of or to manage than others. Seriously, so, man. That's so me. So, I mean, you grew up, basically, blind in one eye, and then at eight years old, you're diabetic. I mean, how much of a struggle was that on a daily basis? What, being diabetic? And blind in one eye. Uh, it, <laughs> I don't think was is the proper thing to say, because, I mean, it's still kind of, I don't know, it's hard. It's hard to talk about, because I know I understand both perspectives and both views that a person can have of me one being well he's complaining about his situation he's not changing it or doing anything about it and then the other that oh well I kind of understand because I don't have that disability I don't know what it's like to not be able to see or have certain depth perception so yeah it's hard like even getting around during the day like even taking the bus and stuff like I don't see street signs are hard I can't drive but, I mean, as a kid, though, Rotten, I know you're still dealing with this every day of your life and have for, you know, 30-something years. But I'm saying, man, as a kid, growing up, all the kids are on the playground, all the kids are doing whatever, and you you know what I mean? Like, you're, yeah. I, I just, I, I can't imagine. I just, I just want to know how it felt from, you know, your perspective. Um, yeah, it was hard as a kid. I mean, you know, it hasn't changed much except for... The feeling of it being difficult is a little bit different situations than in as in an adult as being a, than being a kid. Like when you're a kid, it's like like being diabetic sucked. Where like you're at birthdays and you're like, oh, dude, everybody gets to have cake and I don't get to have cake. And that sounds cheesy, like or lame. Like as an adult, like who cares? Like I I'm a grown adult. I can go without cake. It's a bummer, but. I can have something else to substitute, like my diet drink or whatever that I like to have. That makes me happy. But as a kid, it was really hard to like, kind of like, and it's a big social thing, and then everyone goes, oh, well, how come you can't eat cake? Oh, man, how come you can't, you know, how, you mean you'll get sick? And then kids don't understand that, like, candy equals sick. And then their thought is my same thought is like, oh, dude, that sucks. You mean you can't eat candy? <laughs> you know? But I uh, I made up for all that uh, one year. At my, I, I don't, I think I was like eight, nine. I think, yeah, it was about eight or nine. I was about a year into being diabetic, two years in. And I come to the conclusion, I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't get this Halloween thing. I'm like, wait a minute. So, like, I'm kind of your minion to get you guys candy. And then my parents kind of looked at me, and I'm like, well, I'm just getting candy for you. I'm just your middleman, right? Like, I'm getting you the drug. So, what do I get out of this? I'm like, I get maybe one or two pieces of that of that really big, like, you know, uh, bag of candy. Yeah. And, and I'm like... <laughs> and they're, they're like, my dad like knew what I was getting to, and I'm like, so you should like pay me for the candy. <laughs> and then they're like, ah, oh. and I remember my parents being like, ah, oh, shit, the kid figured out that like we're using him to get the kid get the candy. So they waited out, and that year I was uh, I was the ultimate warrior nice. for Halloween. Nice. I painted up my face, and I had fake muscles and the whole deal. And uh, my aunt, I remember my aunt. Uh, who I was 
she was my job. I was mowing lawns for her, and that's how I was able to buy like wrestling videos and punk rock records. Like I would go to Hermosa Beach and go to the record store, and then you could like you could spend ten dollars on a couple of records or at least two. You know, you could get a good stack of seven-inch records, and um, we, and then at the end of the night, my parents would weigh the the can they weighed the candy, and you know, my aunts and uncles put rocks in the bag and like made the bag weigh more, and I got a bunch of money, and of course, I I spent it on, um, you know, records and wrestling. Right? Yeah, yeah. And, and you it's, know, magazines. I used to pick up wrestling magazines. I know when you had Drake on, he had spoke. About he and I being into the magazines, I was huge. The, I was a fucking mark for the magazines like, and comic books. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I spent. Yeah, I lost a lot of that stuff over the years, but yeah, I spent a lot of money as a kid uh, on marking out on that kind of stuff. Like, I, I guess I still, I still do. I still buy magazines and and stuff. Definitely, man. And, and so it seems to me like you know, pro wrestling. You know, comic books and music were kind of just your outlet, man. That's what you enjoyed. That's what, you know, for me, like, wrestling always takes me out of all the real-life crap that I have to deal with. I get to get involved, and I get to zone into wrestling, and now whatever happened in the real world, ah, whatever, man. I'm living in this wrestling world now. Screw the real world. Seems like that's kind of maybe the same for you. Um, and then, you know, you know, growing up as a teenager, man, I mean, did you know that you wanted to be a, a, a musician or a pro wrestling manager I mean, what was your mindset? Yeah, I knew pretty early on. Um, I'm actually really glad. I was kind of hoping you would ask that because I there, I don't get to tell anybody this because they just they don't know and it never comes up because it's kind of a small part of my life. But it's very the very beginning of wrestling and sort of in the same time the beginning of like wanting to play music. After my dad had had, had like um, I had been fingering through his records for years and then then I started getting my own collection. I started being like started discovering that oh well there's bands of my generation that are making records making lps you know and there's there's this underground music scene and there's all this music and i can i can find all this stuff and i would buy like wrestling videos and cassette tapes and stuff but i when i was about nine or ten i used to listen to a radio show called Wrestle Talk that was hosted by Dynamite D who wrestled in the California territory for a long time and he was from Southern California and had trained at a place called Slammer's Slammer's Wrestling Gym and this radio show was for I, I think the kids will get younger people will get a kick out of because I I don't know if you remember but some people will when you would order a pay-per-view, there was always a channel, a cable channel, that was like just colored lines on the screen, or just like one color, and it had like old computer print, like typed print, and it would say, coming Sunday, April, whatever, WrestleMania, uh, 30, $39.99 or whatever the price, whatever. But there would be sound, and they would, it was a radio station that was connected to, to that cable station. And that's what WrestleTalk was on. It was on the cable radio network, and he would put over the school. He would talk about the school every week. And I would, like, be, my ear would be glued, and I remember my grandfather would be like, What do you watch? There's nothing on the TV. What are you listening to? It's like, it's wrestling. It's, they're talking about wrestling, Grandpa. You know, and they would, it was kind of like a magazine show. But now I would love to listen to them and hear the little bits that are where they're kind of breaking kayfabe a little bit. Because I know they didn't back then. Um, and that's how I found out about Slammers. And so I begged and begged my parents. I was like, you got to take me to Slammers. you got to take me there. 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 And they were like, okay, keep your grades up and maybe we'll think about it. And I did. And I had a hard time. I was in special ed like early on. So... I missed out on a lot of like educational opportunities, but I kept good enough and I kept out of trouble. I wasn't grounded <laughs> and uh, they took me there and I went there twice. The first time no one was there. The second time uh, they weren't like taking anybody. I didn't really get to see the ring or anything, but that was my first attempt at like going to be a wrestler. Like I had decided I was 
Yeah, that's what I wanted to do. Now, Slammers um, is the wrestling training school. Where was this located at, and like, who were the guys behind it running the running the show? Um, I know it was in Sun Valley, and I as then I was a kid, so I was a, you know I was a mark. I didn't know who the trainers were or anything. I just knew that Dynamite D was a part of it. I knew that he had trained because he had mentioned it on the show. I remember hearing that. I remember him saying, talking about training with other guys. But I didn't know anything about it. I didn't know. I had never been in in or near a ring. I hadn't been to a wrestling show. I hadn't even been to a live event yet. Not um, even a WWE event? No, not yet. Not yet. At this point, and you're, what are you, like 14, 15, 16? I'm like 9, 10. Oh, okay. And I remember them telling, I remember my mom saying, you know, the guy said that you're a little too young to wrestle. Just a little, right? Nine. (laughs) Wrestle. Well, I was was turning 10. I think I had just turned 10. Um, I was pretty young. And they were like, well, you know, he would have to learn to amateur wrestle for a long time before he could get in a ring. And I... It's weird because I think of it in two different ways. I think of it in the adult way and being in the business and understanding where they're coming from now. But I also hear it, feel it, and get it as the kid of going, oh, they're telling me that I can't even wrestle for a couple years. I have to be a certain age. I already had got the concept of that there's a weird wrestling law. And I was like, and law was like, well, you're a kid and you could get hurt. And I didn't think then of the liability of, like, my parents are could be liable for me, you know, having hurt my neck or something. Right. But I tried. Um, my dad and I briefly met who I think was Dynamite D. I think it was Dynamite D or maybe, uh, you know, Ferrara. And I only say that because when he describes himself in his shoot interviews... Of going there, how he had long blonde, you know, typical wrestler guy hair. I remember that guy. That's who he was. He looked like Michael Hayes. You know, he had the long blonde hair, but kind of mullet hair, and had the beard, a little bit balding on the top, <laughs> like he was losing hair in the front, a little bit. But he was like, he was wrestler guy. I remember seeing him, and I came in, and I thought I was like going to be a wrestler i had my little wwf old school wwf uh, uh like gym bag it was blue and it had the old white and gold logo and i was like ready i was like i was gonna wrestle and you're 10 years old yeah and you're meeting these guys for the first time and they're telling you you know do amateur wrestling and they're kind of kayfabing you on a lot of stuff so what did what was your next step man i mean did you go check out their live events did you continue to hang out with the guys i mean god 10 years old man i can't imagine somebody 10 years old trying to hang out with a wrestling company and, and, and get trained so i mean what was the process going forward I, well, I think as a kid, I didn't have the concept. I wasn't an adult enough to to really evaluate and think about the rules and the laws and the things that would go along, the responsibilities that would go along with going to a wrestling school. I just knew I wanted to go there to learn to do what Tito Santana did or what Hulk Hogan did or what the Rockers did or whoever it was that I watched. I knew I, I kind of wanted to do that, but I felt the same way about music. Like, I really was, at this time, I was begging for a guitar, too. Like, I wanted a guitar so bad. I kept, every year for Christmas, I was like, you guys, give me a guitar. And my parents were kind of like, they got it, but I think they thought that I was, it. a $300 uh, piece of equipment was a lot of money to spend on me deciding not to do it. You know what I mean? To just go, oh, I'm not into the, this this year, because it's not the popular thing. And so, I didn't get one for a while, but... Um, the wrestling thing, like, at that point, I think I just kind of figured, well, that was the end of the road. Like, my parents won't take me at 10 or 11, 9, somewhere within that that age. I didn't have a way to get there, and I wasn't going to be brave enough to take a bus. It just wasn't a thought process. It wasn't a concept in my mind to just go myself. So I kind of, I ended up... My attitude, I remember as a kid being like, well, I'll be a wrestler one day. One day I'll get, I'll be doing something 
I'll be doing something. And then when I became, when I was a teenager, I started, um, yeah, and when I got old enough to like sort of move out of the house and stuff, um, I started, it, it was like indie fever because it was like, I remember I was at an age where I realized, oh, wait, there's been these indie companies, and you can, oh, I started, and I started reading, and I'm like, oh, it's Carney, so you can just, like, fucking walk in there and and maybe ask somebody and get some information or train or, and, and then I started thinking, well, how do you get a job as a commentator or a manager? Is there an, a position you take to do that? Do you apply? And then... When I moved from Southern California, when I moved after high school and after, you know, struggling for a while, after being homeless for a long time and stuff, I had met somebody at the homeless shelter I was living at who um, had moved up here, up north, uh, Drake. Uh, Drake Nelson. Yeah, Drake Nelson. And I, he had said, he called me up one day. He had emailed me and called me and said, Hey, man, you need to come up here and do wrestling. He's like, you're meant for it. He's like, you should really try it. And I was playing music down there. I was doing the acoustic punk thing. I had gone far enough in my music that I was playing on my own. Before that, I had you know band, a, a band in high school and stuff. Yeah, I want to talk about some of that, Ron, because we can't just brush over that. You're like, oh, I was in a homeless shelter, and I met Drake Nelson. <laughs> and we can brush over that, man. How did you end up... I mean, you, you, you played in some bands in high school? Yeah, yeah. And then yeah. transitioning out of high school, how did you end up in a homeless shelter, bro? Well, well the band thing came really early on uh, in terms of like uh, high school. Like, I was a... Uh, I would say my eighth and ninth grade year of high school um, is when now so see so eighth grade seventh eighth grade I'm old enough to be like now I'm pursuing records I'm pursuing bands that I like and my cousins had turned me on to like Black Flag and like I remember distinctly falling in love with Black Flag like hearing um, depression and hearing um, you know I remember m- my one of my favorite I guess punk rock stories to tell is my sister had taken uh, the family car uh, take it, it, to get pizza and she brought me along and this was when we were in high school and she went through the school and our lockers were like hallways they were separated hallways so you, it would be like going through a box if you went through in a car and that's what she did but when she turned out of it to go back into the quad and then pull out of the school, she hit a locker and it scraped the rubber lining. There was like a line on the side of the car to protect the door so if you opened it quick, you wouldn't crunch the center of the door or whatever. And like she was so scared that she was going to... Because my dad would have killed her. Like, because my dad would have instantly blamed it on... Instantly, he would have appropriately thought you were fucking off with your friends and you you were irresponsible with the car. And so she's like, you can't tell dad, you can't tell dad, you can't tell anyone it was an accident. Somebody hit us in the in the parking lot. And I'm like, ah, Stacy, I'm not, I'm not going to go along with your lie. And then I'm like, well, okay, well, we have to say something. And we're kids, right? We're teenagers, so of course we're going to lie. <laughs> we're not going to tell our parents. <laughs> we're teenagers. And so, before we pull up to the house, I'm like, all right, I'll vouch for your lie, but you got to take me to the record store next weekend. That's why I fucking blackmail. Blackmail Bradley Rotten. That's how you got to do it. Yeah, I did. I pulled a a full heel on my sister, (laughs) and and I I blackmailed her. And I feel kind of bad now because it was a mean kid thing to do, but my sister was the older sister and she had done what older siblings do and they're mean to their younger siblings they just are that's how that's how it works and so this was like revenge and so she bought me my first batch of like really good punk records like stuff that i wish i still had today now bradley rotten we got so much to talk about bro and we're already getting close here on time we got some time but i i I wanted you to take me through uh briefly like like your bit your experiences at first getting into a into a band and and like some of your favorite memories and then of course going back to how did you end up in that homeless shelter man people want to (laughs) know like uh like how you put that over people want to know we want to know uh yeah uh well High school, 
like I think a lot of uh, musicians that end up being career musicians or, or try to be career musicians um, it, it really honestly was all about the bond I had with my friends in high school like I okay so the little street that I grew up on in Torrance we me and all my friends called Peach Street uh, we because our buddy our friend Matthew we his nickname was Peach and he's probably going to live there forever. He's been there forever. His family has lived on that street. The street I grew up on forever. And so we we all kind of discovered punk rock together there. And we would, we were all at, in it. then you could still go to a record store and like find stuff. Like you couldn't go on the internet and just look up a band or go on Facebook and have someone share something with you. You had to physically go out and try to be social and, you know, talk to people and go to the record store and you would go into the record store and the guy, if you were regularly, a regular there, the, you, would, you would be hip to stuff because they would turn you on to bands that were coming through town. So, like, every weekend was an adventure to, like, oh, who's fucking playing this weekend? So, like, you'd walk in, like, there was a place called uh, Scooters and it was a little hole-in-the-wall place that we all went to in Hermosa. And it was literally like the size of my living room. But, I mean, it was jammed. It was crammed with records. Like, I mean, it had a bunch of good stuff. Lots of local music. Um, and just really hard to find rare, obscure punk rock. So is that where you met guys that you would eventually be your bandmates? Kind of. We more met in high school together and being in the neighborhood. But I would also associate going to the record store because we would meet in the neighborhood. And then... We would all go, well, uh, so, like, what do you guys want to do? Like, because we were kids, you know? So we would go skate. We would go skate over to El Camino College. And then we'd skate up to our buddy Detlef's house. Then we'd bug one of our, our older siblings to go take us to the beach. And if you went to Hermosa Beach, Redondo Beach, or, or on Pacific Coast Highway, there was a record store or sometimes two or three record stores within that street and we would just hit them up and then that's not even counting like garage sales we'd find where like i remember going to garage sales and finding stacks of old oingo boingo records and just like really cool stuff so that's how we all became friends and then listening to punk rock we're like i mean i know it sounds cliche but it's and it's very classic story but we like kind of heard the ramones and we're like well this looks easy and then we're like, well, and then we all just kind of, at the same time, begged for instruments. And then, <laughs> so Detlev had a guitar, and I had a guitar, and I had a little amp and a microphone. And Detlev's friend, Kevin, played drums. And then our friend Grant was always fiddling around with something. He always had a bass or had a, a guitar. And I was like, oh, let's start a band. And then something that was kind of just something to do on the weekends ended up, well, hey... Uh, so the guy at Frogs was talking to me and told me he wanted us to play. And then, so there you go, then you gotta show up Frogs. And then you gotta make flyers and tell people, and pretty soon you're in a band. Yeah, and no, that's kind of how it happened. Take me through that, Rotten. You're, do you remember your first gig? And like, how did it come about? Where was it? And how did it feel getting on stage for the first time and performing? <laughs> uh, my first gig I guess like official gig where like I call the promoter or like because like the, the first show really was where I advertised it myself and that was one thing about punk that I loved was like the idea of being able to go to a, a Kinko's or a copy place DIY D yeah yeah and just spend your 10 cents on your on your copies or whatever or your, or your couple bucks to make 50 or 100 or whatever and do it kind of on your own you didn't really need a middleman or anyone else you could just tell your friends about it it was my friend's house and i don't remember what friend but the house was right across the street from the high school which is perfect <laughs> and their backyard had a back uh like a patio like there was a big sliding glass door from the from the living room and it had like a patio deck I was like, oh, this is like a stage. And they're like, oh, this is perfect. We'll put on a show here. And, like, 
that was kind of all there was to it. There was we didn't think about whether it was legal or whether the cops would come, or like it was so innocent. It was so very like, oh, we're in a band. Oh, so and so's in a band. Hey, let's see if so and so's band wants to play, and we'll play. And then it was like we'll have a party, and it was the big attempt at like having the big the big party and having bands play, and no one showed up. You know, and the whole thing, and it was just me and my friends, and we just, and we still played, and we played a set of cover songs, and some, like, the two or three songs we had written ourselves, and then that was kind of the beginning of it, and then the first show we did was at a place called Frogs, because we went there, like, religiously, week, weekend after weekend, we, there was a local band called FYP, who we had seen every weekend, like, we went to go see them all the fucking time, and finally, my friend Chris Vaccarella said he would. He just decided he was going to get us some shows. He didn't even tell us. He just he basically posed as our manager without telling us. And he called the Whiskey a Go Go, and he called um, Frogs, and we got a gig at Frogs, and we got a gig at the Whiskey. And he like he told them that he was our manager, and he got us a gig. Did you get paid? Yeah, we did. We did. We got paid for our first uh, uh, the. The the Frogs gig was, I remember, we ate with it. We went to Denny's, and we all, like, celebrated. We're like, wow, we did our first show. And it was with uh, Divisia, uh, Canker Sores, uh, who later became the Icarus Line, um, a band called Mouthful of Sores, and then my band, Society's Mistake. <laughs> I love the name. And then... Uh, a band called Impact. And then we had another show there at Frog with uh, War Called Peace and uh, One-Handed Readers and uh, just like South Bay, like Southern California punk bands, you know? And we were like teenagers and like hanging out with those people. And, you know, and my friend Brian, who was a senior when I was a freshman, he introduced me to a lot of people who were like who still play music now and stuff like Nathan Maxwell who is a great like I'm glad I have got to meet him he's a really nice guy like you know we just like I didn't my band wasn't huge or anything but we were a little band little goth punk band and we just played around high school we played like record stores and we played a couple venues played the whiskey twice and then we broke up because we had all that was the end of high school it was like kind of like a time period we're like okay we're adults now we have to figure out what we're going to do and I kind of had to move away and traveled around and was homeless for a while and they kind of formed the other band members formed a, a really great band called By All Means and um, then I kind of branched off and moved around and, and ended up where I'm at now. <laughs> yeah, you, you met Drake Nelson at that homeless shelter, man. We got right. we came full circle mm -hmm. here on that. Where you're at the homeless shelter, you meet Drake Nelson, and you guys end up traveling to Chico, California. Uh, take me through that, man. What was that journey like? Um, well, just out of high school, I had nowhere to go, and I was living for a long time. I lived right around the corner from all those friends I was just talking about, Matthew and uh, my friend Chris, and. Uh, the by all means guys in that that group those people that I kind of consider family um, after uh, I was I was like living in in an abandoned school like when school was the preschool or middle school was let out it was just a trailer school there was just a bunch of trailer classrooms I would break in to, through the window and crash and they finally kind of had the intervention where they're like all right Brad look we know you have talent we know you have skill but you have this serious problem where you're like you're not you're having a really hard time maintaining work and we think you need to get help of some kind or go to a shelter or go somewhere where you can get a platform to like better your living situation but like otherwise you're not going to be able to play shows or do shows or or watch wrestling or do any of the stuff you like to do and we don't want to see you get you know in the hospital or whatever and it's always that is always hard to take in but I took it and so I ended up going to the Covenant House in Hollywood which was um, looking back probably one of the be better things I've done in my life like I'm 
it was a decision I'm really glad I made. How it, long were you there for? I was there for like two or three years. Um, the first, I I went in on a, a um, crisis no, notice, like, they had different levels. You could decide to stay overnight, and they would give you a place to stay overnight, but at a certain time, you had to leave. You couldn't stay there all day. You, you know, you had to be out. It was a one-time thing. They said, or you could follow the program, and you can be here, and you stay in the first level, and these are the rules. You know, you had to be in at a certain time. You had to be out at a certain time. You had to do certain chores. You had to do um, certain goals, like if you weren't looking for a job and had came back home every day with proof that you went to go look for a job, you were kicked out, which was really cool. It sounds harsh, but it was like, no, the reason why you're here is because you're homeless and you want to get your life productive. This is what you have to do, and it's okay that you don't know how, but we need to teach you. So that was kind of the whole goal, and you went from one level to another and I went to the second level, which was, um, you just, you had a later curfew, you got to go, uh, you got to be out longer, and you, by that point, you had a job, you know, if you got to that point, you had a, a steady job. And I met Drake Nelson there, and we had bonded over breakfast, and our hatred for the shelter, <laughs> and our passion for wrestling, and he said, so what would you come out, you know, it's like jail like what are you in for <laughs> you know and uh he was like oh well, i came out here to do professional wrestling i was like no way i was like oh i love wrestling i've watched it all my life i was like yeah i'm a musician i'm play i play music and i want to do music and i would love to do wrestling but don't know how and he's like oh well that's where i was you know i, was, I want to go look for a place to train and then we both kind of discovered xpw and then there was a friend of somebody that worked at the shelter that had a promotion and we kind of got tips from there and so just like in the time living in the shelter Drake and I would just mark out we like I mean we were to the point to where we would do extra chores just so we could watch uh Ron Smackdown because it was on right after we would have our night meetings they we would have like meetings We'd go through our day, we'd discuss our day, we'd say something positive, we would uh, sign up for chores, and then we would all get ready for bed or whatever. And we would always go, oh, come on, you know, it's on for like one more hour, let us do one more chore. By the time we're done with these three chores, it'll almost be over. And we would always squeeze in the main event. We're like, oh, come on, it's five, it's three more minutes, come on, The Rock is going to come back. And, and like... They're like, well, you better start picking up some dust or something, you know. <laughs> you better start wiping off the counters. And then we that's how we became really good friends. And that's how I eventually ended up coming here. Yeah, I, no. I stayed for a while. But he ended, ended up dating my sister and then moved up here to Northern California. I want to say, I mean, this was a really hot time for wrestling too, man. 2000, 2001, right? When this right, was, yeah, was yeah. going on. So then what did bring you guys to Chico? wrestling um i again you know i constantly always had the conflict with music and wrestling i was writing still i was recording like i would record songs on my little analog four track or whatever but i wasn't doing anything official i did a couple of my coffee shop shows and stuff down there through the shelter um had met some people had met like tom morello from rage against the machine and i had met some reputable musicians who had said my music was good and that I should continue, which was good enough for me, like, to hear someone who's on a major label say, hey, you're a good enough songwriter. I was all about that, but I also wanted to pursue wrestling, and that opportunity came. Drake had messaged me. He's like, man, you should come live with your sister, man. You should come up here. He's like, you should do wrestling. He's like, I found this school up here. And he's like, and it's cool, and it's super interesting, and it's super neat. And he's like you'll love it, and he's like, and you're meant for it, you have too much knowledge of it to not do it, I was like, yeah, I've thought about it, and I've wanted to do it, and, and it was convincing my sister to, to want me to be up here, me and my sister, we, we sort of clash a bit, you know, the, it, it's a sibling thing, 
So Drake Nelson was already up here. He was living with your sister. Yeah. Right? He, had, right. he was dating your sister, and he was calling you. You were still down at the homeless shelter in Hollywood. Right. Telling you to come up here, and you finally did come up here. And uh, what was it like, man? And that wrestling school that you're talking about was Pro Championship Wrestling, yeah. and that wrestling school was the PCW Work Farm out there in Yuba City. And we're running real low on time here, Rotten, but I wanted, I want you to take me through your first day that you walked through the doors at the PCW Work Farm. <laughs> I think Schizo is beating the shit out of Drake Nelson. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, no, I, I remember the car ride. I remember going with Drake and being really excited and him giving me the little tips that he had known about the business that he had... Um, that not only he and I had read, we were already pretty smart. I hate to say the term smart mark because that's just, I don't know, admitting that you're a mark in a negative way and then not admitting that you want to be smart enough to be in the business. You know what I mean? It's almost like giving yourself that nickname. But we were smartening up, I think, a little bit. We were starting, we had known enough to know that there was a trick to it, but we didn't know the, all the tricks. We didn't know all, all the little you know, all the magic to it. Um, but we had definitely seen it as an art form, and we wanted to do it. And he was like, uh, and he, that was his thing. It was like, you got to do the art of it is so awesome. He's like, I, and I remember him going, now, he's like, man, I was really kind of bummed. I knew it was, you know, I knew it was kind of a work, but I knew it was, and, and we're avoiding from saying fake. We're like, <laughs> we're like trying not to say fake. Because, yeah, man, I knew it was, I kind of knew it was fake, but then they find out that it kind of is. Really sucked, but no, no, but when you figure out how they do it, it's fucking awesome. He's like, and there's like a certain formula, and there's a certain way to, to do things, and he's like, just, he's like, just remember the handshake, mm-hmm. and he's like, be polite, and he's like, and and he's like, don't talk back, just just listen. And I said, okay. And my dad had already told me when I was a kid, keep your eyes and your ears open and your mouth shut, which was something that always stuck with me. I thought was really good advice, you know, listen before you speak. And I shook Schizo's hand and I shook Zach's hand and I think Zach's girlfriend at the time, I shook her hand and everybody, you know, I said hello. And I remember meeting Bear and everyone. And then I remember uh, Drake asking if I could do progressions. He said, well, is it all right if Rotten does progressions? And that, uh, by that time, he was already call, calling me Rotten. So I was already Bradley Rotten. It was already something we were kind of joking about, kidding about. We had little little catchphrases or little jokes that we would say like Jobby. Instead of saying Jobber, we'd say Jobby. It's just a little joke. And... Um, He's like, yeah, you think he can do it? And he's like, you think he can do progression? So I was like, I'll, I'll give it a try. And then I did it, and they were like, you did a pretty good job. And then they were like, uh, you know, I said, I, I don't know if I would be a good wrestler, but I would love to do commentary or be a manager. And then they didn't really say anything to me, and I came to a couple practices, a couple training sessions, and then a show came up, and a commentator didn't show up, and Drake's like, Brad can do it. Let Brad do it. Let Brad do it. And then it gets like, ah, he's not in the company. Ah, and everyone was, I remember them kind of being like, ah, like hesitant. And then Drake really vouched for me. He's like, no, I'm telling you, Rotten can do it. Just let him try. I, he, he can do it. He can do a good job. He's like, blame, and if he doesn't blame it on me. And he's like, and then I remember Skit, either Schizo or Zach going, all right, it's your fault if he does a bad job. And then I did it, and they did. hey, you did pretty good. You did all right, kid. You know, they were like, okay. They're like, you like to do commentary? And I was like, I love doing commentary. Yeah, it's great. I love it. Bobby the Brain Heenan, yeah. And they are like, okay. And then they kept me, and they I just kept doing commentary with Drake. And then that eventually led into managing. Yeah, bro. I mean, you did a lot, Rotten. And you did so damn much, man, that we're going to have to get you back on the show so you can continue to tell your story of everything you accomplished since you've been here in Chico with the band Nothing Left and everything you did and all the managing that you've done over the years, man. I want to get you back on the show because we're almost an hour in right here and we still have so much to talk about. Uh, Brad, I want to thank you very much for coming on the show, man. And where can people find more out about Bradley Rotten? Nothing left 
on the social media? Um, I don't have official, like, um, a nothing left, uh, like, page or a Bradley Rotten page. They're all connected to my Bradley Justin Finney, which is my Facebook page, my personal page. But if you go to the groups, you can find a Nothing Left group, and that's where I post up flyers for shows. And, um, you know, just little things, even if I write a new song or I have a new song and I post it up, um, I put a video up, I put it up there. Um, and in my Bradley Rotten page, where you will find me doing nothing but insulting you, more than likely, <laughs> um, you can find on uh, at Twitter, you know, Bradley Rotten. And you can also find a Facebook page that's associated with my Bradley Justin Finney page. And uh, although I don't use it that often, um, I love to use it to um, for my character and my character personality of Bradley Rotten and telling people about my clients and all that stuff. He tells it like he smells it. All right. Bradley Rotten, Bradley Justin Finney, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you very much for having me. It was a pleasure. Definitely got to get that guy back on the show. Bradley Justin Finney, Bradley Rotten, nothing left. Thank you very much for coming on the show, and I can't wait for part two. Now, I also can't wait to get back to the PCW work farm. You know, as I was doing my intro, I somehow forgot to mention that I've been at the damn PCW work farm the last three weeks, and it's been absolutely incredible uh, to see all these uh, new, young, hungry prospects um, and just seeing how hard they're willing to work and how much they want it. And, uh, you know, I damn, I miss that. So it's been great being back with Zach, of course, the head trainer, Zach Reed, Mr. Primetime. If you guys want to get trained, if you want to learn the art of professional wrestling, you know, Call that man up because he's been doing it for almost 20 years and he's been doing it all over the world at the highest level. Give him a call. 530-315-4020. Tell him you heard about him on Mitch, please. And uh, if you want it bad enough, go get it. Training sessions go Thursday from 6 to 9, and Sunday 11 till 3, 4, 5, depending on how long you want to stay. Also, guys, every Wednesday night in Paradise at the Italian Garden, check out the House Cats. They're doing their thing. They've been doing it there for over a year, and they uh, put on a great show. And uh, if you guys want to book the House Cats, check them out on Facebook. Look them up, like them, share them, and then if you want to book them, book them, because you're going to get a great show. Great music, great entertainment, and uh, I can't wait till I'm able to attend another House Cat event because I'm going into surgery as I record this uh, in less than like I don't know, like thirty something hours, and uh, I am terrified. Like I don't know if you can tell by the sound of my voice, it's really starting to hit me. And uh, you know, hey, if this is the last episode of Mitch, please. Because I die in surgery, we're going out with a bang. I'm really proud of this show. I'm really thankful to everybody that's listening. And, uh, you know, of course, uh, if you want to find out what, what's going on more with my surgery. You know, it's not really a major surgery, uh, it, hopefully. So I'm hoping to be, you know, out of there in a couple hours. You know, in rehab in a week, you know, and... Um, just back and feeling good in, in, you know, a couple weeks, you know, whatever. They say three to six months. I say, eh, let's do it in less than two. And uh, regardless, um, like I said, uh, follow follow me on Twitter, guys, at HeartbreakerMV. Um, also, Snapchat at HeartbreakerMV. Instagram at HeartbreakerMV. And Mitch Valentine on Facebook, if you guys want to stay up on the surgery and what's going on uh, with all of that. And... Of course, Mitch, please, on Facebook as well. Give that a like and a share. And uh, invite the heck out of your friends. But regardless of what happens with this surgery, unless I die, I will be performing again. And I will be performing on November 5th at the Garfield Park Church in, uh, I believe it's in Santa Cruz, 111 Eret Circle in Santa Cruz. 
and of course that's for fist combat and i and like i talked about earlier you know making my debut for fist combat with cupid mikey shoop we're both gonna be there we're undefeated so we're gonna issue another challenge whoever they got it doesn't matter because it's going down November 5th, Garfield Park Church. All ages. Show starts at 8. Out there in Santa Cruz, California. But there's more. Because on November 11th, at the Appleton Grill, in Watsonville, well, I'm going to show up there too, and I'm going to do what I love to do. So if you guys can make it out to one of those events, that'd be really cool. You know, and uh, there will be more events I will be announcing in the future so keep listening to the show and keep supporting what i'm doing i really appreciate it and i think that we're going to end the show with that and we're going to kick it over right now to bradley justin finney bradley rotten nothing left the bottom of my glass thanks for listening